All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good to see you all. A couple announcements just before we uh, get the service started. Oh, don't worry about him. I know, we don't like announcements. Um, we have a congregational meeting, uh, January 30th. The agenda is posted on some of the doors on your way out. Um, so make sure that you're there. We'll, we'll make sure to announce that the next couple weeks too. Next Saturday is our painting day in the nursery. We're finally getting the nursery painted, so make sure that you can be there for that. And uh, we'd love to announce that the women's study is coming back January 31st, Monday night. Um, so there's a sign-up sheet. Is it in the back? Sign-up sheet is over there. You'll see it. So women's study, uh, they're doing a Jen Wilkins study on the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, which is better. It's 10 weeks, starts at 7 o'clock, so make sure that you can be there for that. Um, and as we turn to reading God's word, we're in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. So Luke 19, verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom, and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, and said to them, Engage in business until I come. Until I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom... He ordered these servants, to whom he had given the money, to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are, you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not, what, taking what I did not deposit, and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him, and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, Bring them here and slaughter them before me. And this is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we, we ask this Sunday morning that you would bless us as we gather together here as a church. Lord, each Sunday reminds us of Jesus, your rising from the grave, and that someday we too will rise again to a holier, truer, and more heavenly-like life. So God, we pray that you would help us to walk in the shadow and the shine and the glory of your love. As we wait upon you, God, I pray that you would renew our strength so that we would be able to run without getting tired, that we would walk without becoming faint on the weeks and days and months that lie before us. God, this morning we think of some of our 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 members that, that are sick with COVID, Lord, we think of Andy Keating, we think of Charlie and Doreen Black. Lord, we just pray that you would bless them, that you would help them, encourage them in Christ, and Lord, that you would heal them, that you would bring them back to full health from COVID. God, I pray that you would strengthen their family and their friends and people that love them and care for them and help them look and trust in you, Jesus. God, we ask you that you would bless us in, in both our, our own personal, private worship this morning and in our public worship 
this morning. We pray that your blessing would would be over all the, the worshiping churches in our area. We think of Rehoboth Baptist Church. We think of Grace Harbor Church in New Bedford and in Providence. We think of House of Bread Church in Taunton and many others. God, we pray that today would be a spiritual renewal in all of these churches, and ours included. God, we pray for the children in these churches this morning, that your grace would fill the heart of each teacher and that each child that receives teaching and instruction would be blessed by your word. Lord, we also pray that you would bless your missionaries and missionaries that we support. We pray for John and Jan Baxter and their work in refugee ministry. We pray that you would bless them as they have opportunities in ministry in Egypt. Lord, that you would give them wisdom and discernment, that you'd fill them with your Holy Spirit, and that you would continue to strengthen them and encourage them for this worthy service and work. God, we pray that you would bless us in our worship today. Lord, help us to leave behind the worldly thoughts and cares that we may have. And as we enter into worship you, and as we wait for you, that we would receive teaching and instruction from your word, and that your spirit would encourage us and lead us into the truth so that we would be strong for battle and strong for working for you. Lord, help us today as we minister to others. We pray that we would be enabled in our own home to to give each other the blessing of love and peace and care in Christ. And Lord, help us to carry comfort to people who are suffering and enduring hardships and are in sorrow, that we would cheer, cheer up people who are discouraged and that we would give sympathy to people who are in distress. Lord, we pray this morning that you be glorified and that you would bless us with your love, peace, and presence as we sing to you, our great God and King, because you deserve all honor and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Let's praise together.
epic praise. When you're praising God anytime, it's epic praise. How's that?
sing our doxology. church. God bless you all. You may be seated. Well, kids can be dismissed to the Children's Church. And uh, as you guys are heading out, if there are any people that want to help serve in the children's ministry, it would be great. Could use some, some new volunteers. Um, so if you have a Bible, turn with me to Daniel chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to finish up Daniel 2. And um, as you're turning there, let's start together with the word of prayer. God, we declare this morning, Jesus, you are everything. All we have is Christ. Jesus, you are our life. So Lord, this morning I ask that we ask that you would bless us as we open up your word. Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would give joy to your people, that you'd bring salvation to the lost and that you gain glory for your name. God, I pray that you would uh, continue to to strengthen us as a body and people, and Lord, that your word would be an encouragement to us, that you would apply it to our heart and lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You know, mankind thinks that things will always be the way it is, that nothing will ever change. The weather in New England Man, it's always going to be cold. People will always cheer for their beloved sports team. People will always have back pain. A wife will think that their husband isn't listening to them. And a husband will think that their wife is nagging them. People will always try to accumulate money, power, and praise for themselves. Governments will always try to promote themselves as the solution to the world's problems, even though many of the problems in the world were caused by other governments. We think that these things will last forever. And you know, you look throughout history, and each of the the dominant powers in the world truly believed that they would last forever. Like the Egyptians thought they would last forever, the Greeks, the Romans, they all thought that they would never be defeated. And then as the centuries rolled on, kingdoms failed. In the modern era, we see this. The glory of the kingdoms in the middle centuries of Europe, they all faded. The infamous steel curtain of the Soviet Union lasted only 69 years. The thousand-year Reich of the Germans lasted only 12. So we see kingdoms rise They gain incredible influence and power. They become too big to fail until they fail. And when they fail, it's a drastic collapse. And that's because no no human power will remain. And one day, history will look back on America and the Americans who lived during this prosperous time 
in the same way that we're looking back on the Egyptians and Greeks and Romans. So if you're feeling hopeless about the current political prospects in our country and in the world, then you're in the right place. Because Daniel 2 will show us that the God of heaven, who sets up kings, also tears down kings. And at the end of history, God will replace all human kingdoms with his everlasting kingdom. So this reality should give God's people hope. So if you walk through the door feeling hopeless, well, God's word is here for you to give you hope. That God will replace powerful earthly kingdoms with his glorious everlasting kingdom. That's good news for us this morning, isn't it? So Daniel chapter 2, it starts with Nebuchadnezzar's bad dream. The king of Babylon then calls upon the wise men to interpret this dream, but he refused to tell them the contents of the dream, which is a problem. The king wants the wise men to not only interpret the dream, but to reveal the contents of the dream to the king, and they tell the king that this is impossible. This made the king angry, and he ordered all the wise men in Babylon to be killed, to be put to death. This fate included Daniel and his friends. When Daniel hears that the king was asking for an interpretation of the dream, he asks the king for more time. So Daniel then goes to the Lord God in prayer, and God answered. And God gave Daniel both the contents of the dream and the meaning of the dream. Daniel then stops to praise God and give thanks to him because the Lord has given Daniel wisdom to make known the king's dream. And now this is where we catch up in Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 24. Daniel goes to the king to interpret the dream. Look at verse 24. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. We just have to pause there for a second. We see what's going on here. Daniel finds Arioch, who's the executioner, his own executioner, and to the other wise men in Babylon. So Arioch is, is a political bureaucrat, and he takes credit for finding Daniel when in reality, it was Daniel that found him. Arioch was ready to execute Daniel, but Daniel stepped up and said he could interpret the dream of the king. And so Arioch goes and takes credit for this sudden turn of events. He's acting like the rest of the world, passing the blame when failures, uh, blame of your failures onto other people and taking credit for the success of other people. Arioch's proud attitude is in contrast to Daniel's humility before the king. Look at Daniel's humility. Look at verse 26. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days? Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after, you, after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what, it, what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than, than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. So it's interesting here that Daniel, he doesn't take any credit. He doesn't take any credit for interpreting this dream. He doesn't talk about his own wisdom. He doesn't talk about his own education that he got in Babylon. Instead, you look at verse 28 to see where Daniel gives all the credit. He says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And that's in contrast to 
the wise men, the enchanters, the magicians, and the astrologers who can't do what God has asked, or what, what the king has asked. It's the God of heaven who can do it. So Daniel didn't fall into the self-promotion like the world. Instead, he exalted God and told about the greatness of God. So we see Daniel's humility. He's a humble servant of God. You know, humility is, is the ability to see your own size correctly when compared to the overwhelming greatness of God. And our greatest problem is this, that we aren't sincere in our humility. We know how to fake it. That's a temptation for all of us. I mean, I see it in myself. When I'm serving or doing something in some way, I want people to notice. I, t- I, you know, I tell people that anything good in my sermon is from God, but in the back of my heart, you know what's there? Self-promotion and praise. You know, another pastor, he said, uh, pride is pr- plagiarism. If we look at something and say, I accomplished this, when in reality, it's a gift of God. And I think that's true. Pride is plagiarism. It's claiming what really comes from God as your own. And this, the craziest part is that we can even become proud of our humility. Like that's how sinful we are. We gain But we gain true humility when we look away from a mirror and look to God, who in the incarnation took on human flesh in Jesus to show us what true humility is and looks like. Because Jesus was truly dependent upon his Father. Jesus was truly authentic in how he turned away from the spotlight and how he turned away and turned down glorious earthly positions in order to serve the outcasts of society, the lepers and the sinners. And so Jesus shows the heart of a humble servant to his death on the cross, where he was mocked, spit upon, and suffered. You see, only Jesus was humble. Only Jesus was actually and truly humble. And when we think about the humility of Jesus, that's when we can be amazed at God's glorious salvation and gracious salvation to us, which has nothing to do with with my abilities or your abilities, but has everything to do with Christ's work in my place and in your place. See, we can't promote ourselves when we're standing next to the cross. How could we? How could we claim anything good in us when we're standing next to a crucified Savior? We can only exalt Christ, especially when we consider that the grace of God is poured upon me and you, sinful rebels against God. And once we see God's mercy and grace, that's when we start to gain true humility and real humility. And Daniel's life reflected this type of genuine humility. That's how he was able to give God all the glory for showing him the dream and giving him the interpretation. Daniel didn't take any credit for himself. Instead, he now reveals the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 31. He says, You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that was struck, that the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So if you're a visual person, you can visualize what's going on here in the dream. The dream that the king had was about a statue. The statue had four parts. 
It was a massive statue of human design and human making, just like the Tower of Babel was made of brick and mortar, except this statue, this monument, was made of precious metals. It had a head of gold. It had chest and arms of silver. It had a midsection of bronze. It had legs of iron and feet of iron mixed with baked clay. It's a statue of human, of human made by the hands of humans. And as the king was watching, there's a rock that's cut out of the foundation of the statue. And verse 34 says, it was cut out by no human hand. And this rock then struck the iron and clay feet of the statue, and the entire statue fell and tipped over. And the iron, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, they all shattered, and they all disintegrated, and the wind blew them away. And verse 35 says that the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So just pause for a second. Why do you think this dream was then so troubling to the king? Maybe the king thought that the statue in the dream represented him. Nebuchadnezzar was only in his second year, and so maybe in this dream he sees a stone cut out that strikes him and destroys him into dust, and then that stone becomes a great mountain that fills the, the whole earth. So he might have thought, there's an enemy coming from underneath me that's going to destroy me. That could be why he didn't sleep, right? That could be why he didn't entrust, he didn't trust anybody. That's why he insisted on getting a trustworthy interpretation of the dream from someone who was genuine, who wouldn't just tell him what he wanted to hear, but who could understand it and knew what it meant. And thankfully, this is Daniel. So Daniel now provides the interpretation of the dream for the king. Look at verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom, inferior to you, shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like, that, and that iron, and like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. So this interpretation initially probably reassured the king because Daniel says that King Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. He's the one at the head. He's the one calling the shots. He's the one who has power over man, even animals, and even birds like we see in, in verse 36 and 37. The king's dominion was similar to what Adam was given at creation. Right? Maybe you didn't catch that initially, but this is what the king has been given. But don't miss what Daniel says about the kings and the king of kings. He didn't become the head of gold by his own power or his own desire, but it was the God of heaven who gave him all these things. The kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory. So it's the God of heaven who's the sovereign one over all things. Daniel doesn't shy away from telling the king the truth here, that it's the God of heaven who has the highest authority. We see verse 39 marks an important shift that the king maybe, not, maybe didn't notice, that another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. This probably would have been a shock to the king, that there would be an after Babylon. There would be an after 
Nebuchadnezzar. Things would change. There would be more kingdoms. And each following kingdom would be inferior to the one that was before it. But each kingdom was still strong and had a broad scope of power. The last of the four kingdoms would be strong like iron, but it will prove to be unstable because it's made up of different people who can't hold themselves together. And that's when God will establish his final kingdom out of the fourth kingdom. And that final kingdom will destroy all the other kingdoms, even though it starts small, it will grow to fill the whole earth and be unlike any earthly kingdoms. This kingdom of God will endure forever. So the four kingdoms have been originally thought to be Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Daniel, he gives a clear interpretation of what will happen to all of these earthly kingdoms because that's the main point of the dream. And the interpretation is concerned with what the future holds, not when it will happen. So look at verse 44. Because it continues, this interpretation. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. The kingdoms of men crumble. They are destroyed and they are blown away like dust on the ground. Compare that to God's kingdom. God's kingdom is eternal. It will never be destroyed, and it will never be left to another people. It will stand forever. The Babylonians gave way to the Persians, the Persians to the Greeks, the Greeks to the Romans. But God's kingdom will never be left to anyone else because it will never be destroyed and it's eternal. The kingdom of God is like nothing of the kingdoms of the world. When compared to God's kingdom, worldly powers are like paper tigers. They look fierce and menacing, but they're fake. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 15, God says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. See the connections there? The nations are like dust before God. But it's God's kingdom that has the true power. And Daniel is completely sure of this. Look at verse 45. Daniel says, A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this? And the dream is certain and its interpretation sure. Daniel is like emphatic. This is going to happen. It's going to happen. Now the question is, how would the king react? How would the king react to Daniel who's just told him that he's going to be destroyed and that multiple kingdoms are going to follow him? Should Daniel be afraid of his life? Yes, but not yet. <laughs> Look at verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. And the king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of lords and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. And the king that had previously ordered Daniel to be killed is now bowing down to him because Daniel represents the God of heaven. This is amazing. And the king is in awe of Daniel's God, calls Daniel's God a revealer of mysteries. See, the wise men of Babylon failed, but Daniel's God didn't. The gods of Babylon were blind and unable to work through the wise men, but Daniel's God unveiled the mystery to Daniel, and Daniel declares the mystery to the king. And the king says that Daniel's God is God of gods, who is greater than the gods of Babylon. And the king says that Daniel's God is the Lord of lords, the one who has authority 
over all things. So Nebuchadnezzar is realizing that it's Daniel's God that gave him this kingdom and will give this kingdom to other kings until he makes an end to all human kingdoms and brings about his own perfect kingdom. This is a declaration that the God of heaven is sovereign over all. And look at what happens next. Look at verse 48. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. So Daniel got an immediate promotion. An immediate promotion based on what happened in this dream, in interpreting this dream. From that new position, he gets a position, new positions for his buddies, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're now overseeing the affairs of the province. So Daniel and his friends, who were once under a sentence of death, have now been exalted and elevated because of God's direct intervention. This is amazing to see. And what would this story do? What would this story do for people who are originally hearing this while they're in exile, where they're in a hopeless situation, where they're being oppressed? How would that help them to know that the Babylonian kingdom would be replaced by another, then another, and then another, until God establishes his own kingdom to replace all human kingdoms? How would that give them hope? Well, give them hope because even though that they're far from home, even though they're living in pain and exile, that they can know that God can tear down the most powerful kings and kingdoms in order to set up his own kingdom. And his own kingdom may start small, but it will grow until it fills the whole earth until the rest of eternity. That, that gives them hope to know that God is in control he hasn't failed, and he's accomplishing something for his own purpose and glory. Now, what do we take from this dream? I mean, the king's dream, first and foremost, it helps us to see reality clearly, doesn't it? The glory and the power of this world is temporary. The powerful kingdoms will pass away. I mean, this applies to modern America and Western civilization as much as it applied to ancient Babylon. Whether we live under a red or blue president, under an actively hostile dictatorship, one day the earthly powers will come to an end. Like America is not God's country. One day it will come to an end and God will establish his kingdom forever. And that kingdom will last until eternity. So this, this changes our perspectives on how we view the newspaper, doesn't it? Yeah. This is all passing away. It's all passing away. We don't put our hope in politics. We don't put our hope in politicians because we know they'll fail us because they're sinners just like we are and they need a God to save them. So it changes our perspective on how we see the world and then it changes our perspective in what we pursue. What, what type of kingdom are we building for ourselves? Knowing that this world is passing away, why would we pursue things that the world values when those things will eventually decay and fade away into obscurity? Why would we pursue those things? Wouldn't it make more sense to pursue God's kingdom? See, Christ's kingdom is the only one that will last. And maybe you've felt like your lives have, have little, little significance, and little meaning. And you feel like maybe you're, you're a, a believer in Christ, but you just can't grow in holiness. But the answer isn't to, to wallow in despair. The answer is to look to God's kingdom and put your hope in his promises. And when you have that, that helpful truth in mind, that when things aren't going well for us, when there's sickness and isolation and discouragement, even death, 
it's good to know that there's a kingdom beyond the grave. That this isn't it. And that there's coming a time when this world will become the kingdom of God and of his Christ. That's what we need to know when things are tough. And we need to know that when things are going well too. Like things are going well for Nebuchadnezzar. And he got this message when everything was was just perfect in his life. He had just ascended to the throne. But he's told, hey, there's going to be an after you. And that's what we need to hear too. There's going to be an after you and after me. Our little triumphs and little glories, they're going to lie in the dust after four generations. After four generations, they're pretty much forgotten about. It's kind of sad, right? But when we stand before the creator, God of heaven, to give account, what will we stand upon on that day? Are we going to give account for what we do? Or are we going to stand upon the statue of the world in that kingdom? Or will we stand upon the rock of Jesus Christ? See, God will build his kingdom in our lives and in the world, and nothing can prevent God from accomplishing his purposes. And today we've seen the final chapter of history, and it won't be changed. It's going to happen. And we see it happen. Around 500 years after Daniel... After the kingdoms of Babylon, Persia, and Greece are all gone, Rome now comes into the picture. Rome rules the world, and Jesus comes to earth. Just as Daniel chapter 2 says that God's kingdom would be birthed during the time of the fourth earthly kingdom, and the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, and in Luke chapter 1 verse 33, the angel says, Jesus will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. When Jesus starts his ministry 30 years after that prophecy, he proclaims the gospel of God. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, he says, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You see, Christ's kingdom is not like the kingdoms of the world that advance by power and conquest in the glory of their own strength. Instead, what we see is that the kingdom of God advances by suffering and death. And Jesus led the way. That the kingdom of God, it didn't fully come in the lifetime of Jesus because the Romans were still in charge during the crucifixion of Jesus. And during that crucifixion, it felt like the kingdom of God failed. It felt like all the promises were were ending with Jesus dying on that cross. But instead, it's the sovereign God who can turn defeat into victory because he raises Jesus from the dead and he brings life to all who come to bow down before him and to receive this kingdom as a free gift by faith. And so this kingdom starts out small. This is just as Jesus taught. Remember the the parable of the mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds, but grows into the largest of trees. Christ's kingdom started small, and it grows into an unstoppable force. See, the world's glory, it might seem cool, but there's no future in that. We know where the future is. The future belongs to the kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ. And anyone who doesn't submit to Jesus, who who puts their trust in the things of the world for their salvation, will be rejected and crushed by Jesus. This is what Daniel 2 teaches us, that the world's kingdoms will be shattered by the stone that was cut out by no human hand. The stone cut out by no human hand is the stone that God appointed and that the kingdoms and people will be blown away into the wind. And those who don't have their sins washed away by Christ's righteousness will not stand on that day of judgment. So repent. Believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is here to forgive your sins. And if you've bowed, if you've never bowed your heart to Jesus and asked for forgiveness, today is the day to do it. You know, when Jesus 
resurrected and then ascended back, well, and then ascended to heaven, the disciples, they, they look at the risen Jesus in Acts chapter 1. Remember this question? Acts chapter 1, verse 6. They ask him, Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember this? They don't realize that the kingdom of God comes in two phases. First is the already of the kingdom. That is the first coming of Jesus in his incarnation, in his death, in his resurrection, and his ascension. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. It's now. He says it throughout the Gospels that it's in his presence. The kingdom is here. But, so it's already and it's not yet. The second part of the kingdom of God is that it's not the fullness of God's kingdom coming. That, that second part is the second coming of Christ. When Jesus then tells his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own hand. You see, we don't get to know when Jesus will return. We don't. And anyone who says that they know doesn't really know. And if they say that they know, then it, you can be sure that they don't know. <laughs> this is what Scripture says. Jesus doesn't even know the day or the hour. So Jesus doesn't cure our curiosity. But Acts chapter 1, if we continue in that, in that section, he says to the disciples, he, sets, he puts them out on a mission. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So here we are, 2,000 years after Jesus said that to his original disciples, and what did they do with that, that, that message? They sit at home, twiddle their thumbs, saying, Come, Lord Jesus? Or did they go out on mission and take the gospel to the end of the earth? We see the gospel growing and advancing through those initial disciples. Started with 12, 120, 3,000 at the Jerusalem church, and then thousands after that. Millions and billions, by God's grace, have heard the gospel. So the kingdom of God, it grows like that small little thing and then grows to be this huge, giant mountain by God's grace and for his glory. And so Taunton is the end of the earth. The kingdom of God will be spread to the ends of the earth, just like in that dream that Daniel said. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 35, it said, The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now here's a piece that's even more fascinating. Jesus is the stone. Jesus is the stone. Think of the image that Jesus says throughout his ministries. He refers to himself as the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone, the cornerstone. And everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And if that stone falls on them, they'll be crushed. Jesus said that in, Luke chapter, in, Luke, uh, in Luke's gospel, and he was identifying himself as Israel's Messiah, the stone that crushes the kingdoms of the world. The kingdom of God has come with the first coming of Jesus, and it will come in perfection at the second coming of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, ruling his church from his heavenly throne, and when Jesus returns, his kingdom will replace all all earthly kingdoms, and it will fill the whole earth. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. If you want to turn there, you can. If not, I'll read it for you. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. In the same way that, that our hearts have been regenerated, so also is the way that, that God will regenerate the earth and will regenerate the world, that the kingdom of the world 
will be regenerated and will be turned into the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ who shall reign forever and ever. So have hope. Don't look at the headlines and be fearful and anxious and nervous about what the future holds because Jesus is on the way. He's coming and his kingdom is coming. And we don't need to be afraid because Jesus will give us his kingdom. But we live between the, the already of Jesus' first coming and the not yet of Jesus' second coming. And it's like a sunrise. I don't know about, did you guys wake up before the sun rose this morning? <laughs> Do you guys think about that? So this morning, you know, woke up before the sunrise and before the sun rises, the powerful rays of the sun light up the entire sky. And the light from the sun is so broad that it reaches part of the earth that the sun isn't even visible yet. This is the already, asked, already not yet part of our salvation. That by faith, Christ's light shines salvation into our soul, removes our guilt, gives us power to resist temptation, but we're still waiting. We're still waiting for, for the true dawn of salvation when the presence of our sin is gone for good. You see, at the, at the first coming, the light of salvation broke onto the horizon of our dark world, and at the second coming of Jesus, man, that sun is going to rise. Amen? Amen? And it's going to rise with the full effects where the sin is abolished forever and where God establishes his kingdom on earth forever where he will make all things new. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are amazed at your work and your ways. So Lord, as we've seen in, in this dream of Daniel, of, of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, Lord, it applies to us today, and it applies to the end of civilization, the end that we're looking forward to, to dwell in your kingdom, in your presence, with you forever, without the effects of sin, without tears and suffering and hardship, but in that place where we'll be with you and our, our hope will be realized and our faith becomes sight. Lord, we look forward to that day. Give us strength and perseverance and faith to hold on to you, our glorious God, King, and Savior. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Everybody stand and join us for our closing songs. What songs? My sheets got mixed up.
God bless you all. Amen. It's great to praise the Lord. Thank you, Dan. Let me uh, close with a word of scripture, Revelation 21. Says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. So the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, which is the second death. That's the day we're looking forward to, friends. May the grace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Oh, there's food and coffee in the cafe as well on your way out.